uh, next, uh, I'd like to introduce uh, our second uh, plenary speaker, uh, Professor Yi Tui. Uh, professor Yi is a professor uh, at Stanford University in Material Science and Engineering. He received uh, his bachelor's degree uh, in chemistry from uh, University of Science and Technology of China, PhD from Harvard in uh, 2002. And after that, uh, he became a Miller postdoctoral fellow at UC Berkeley. Uh, in 25, 2005, he gave, became assistant professor at uh, Stanford University and promoted to a uh, full professor with tenure in uh, 2010. He has uh, about uh, 500 papers and edge index of uh, close to 200 and was ranked one, uh, number one in material science uh, by uh, Thomson Reuters as uh, one of the world's most influential scientific minds. He's a fellow of MRS, uh, Electrochemical Society and the Royal Society of Chemistry and an associate editor of Nano Letters. He has won many awards, uh, including the uh, Dan Maiden Prize in Nanoscience, uh, the Nano Today Award, uh, Black Vinic uh, National Laureates, uh, and, and too many that I will not uh, list. He has also funded three uh, companies to commercialize uh, technologies from his group. So uh, with, uh, it's with great pleasure that I welcome Professor Yi uh, to talk about materials design for batteries. Thank you. Well, thank you, Ji, very much for your uh, invitation and also organizing these uh, wonderful conference with a very diverse topic. Uh, I appreciate MIT, you know, stand up to, to do this. And also I see my friends, Mike Aziz right here. From ES talk, I already learned quite a bit about the uh, <laughs> related to nuclear, uh, the, the thermal storage and, and so on. Um, so I will switch, now switch topic to talk about the batteries uh, from more from the materials perspective. Uh, so this is no no uh, uh, no need introduction. So we need storage, right? So um, the storage in form on the top row is that can be moving. You know that's the application. Uh, electronics, strong electrical cars. Um, this type of storage require high energy density, high energy per weight, high energy per volume. And there's also stationary storage. In this case. Uh, these uh, storage is not moving, it's stationary. And then the requirement uh, of, on energy density is reduced. Um, but there's a lot of similarity right there between the stationary and, uh, and the portable storage. We all know batteries have been the ones, you know, uh, for uh, mobile uh, uh, storage. Uh, and, and potentially going into the uh, stationary and uh, <clears throat> in the large scale. Uh, it's recognized certainly last year by uh, Nobel Prize uh, giving to lithium ion batteries uh, to three gentlemen right here. Uh, so then you ask the question, you know, lithium ion has this huge success right, in the past 29 years of uh, enabling mobile uh, storage. Uh, so what's next? What are the remaining big questions we need to answer? Uh, so I call this as grand challenges for energy storage. Well, we continue need to push the envelope of the energy density per kilogram or per liter. So the question is, can you double that or, or even triple? Um, if you double that, it is huge meaning right there on the, uh, the, the mileage or per charge of your car. It could also have implication of the cost as well. And, and also how can we extend this battery life, right? 30 years, uh, calendar life, uh, 10,000 cycles or more, maybe 30,000 cycles. I noticed some battery chemistry, nowadays can do this on the lithium system, right? 10,000 cycles, however, calendar life of 30 years is not really proven yet, far away from being proved. This also has huge meaning if you uh, uh, make a car, after the car retire 12 years, 15 years, and then can, can you still use the battery pack and, and use for the, you know, to having the reuse going to the electric grid. Can we do fast charging? Uh, this is also a game changer as well. If we could do it within 10 minutes, really matching close to what gasoline uh, can do. 
and there's also huge implication on, on the deployment of the uh, uh, electrical cars. Uh, can we make it make it completely safe? You know, with lithium ion, there's so many accidents, fire, explosions still happening. Uh, can we make the battery completely safe without <coughs> this uh, safety uh, concern? Can we reduce the cost down below fifty dollars per kilowatt hour, or or cheaper, depending on the application? Here, I'm more thinking about for the electrical cars. You know, for the uh, long duration storage, let's say an hour, uh, 100 hours, roughly about, you know, you, you talk about four or five days or uh, even seasonal, you, you need the, the, the cost to be even lower. And uh, how do we know the health condition inside? So far battery is a, is a black box, you know, it's very hard to judge. Some bad things is happening. Uh, the battery life is reduced and uh, what are the low cost methods, strategies for battery reuse and recycle? Uh, eventually, you know, the grid scale st seasonal storage, what, what's the answer for that? Is it the uh, electrochemistry, you know, the, the batteries could be the answer? Well, at this moment, you know, it's not clear yet. So with all this in mind, uh, uh, 15 years at Stanford right here, I, I set up a research program, try to address uh, uh, many of those issues. Uh, but today, let me uh, focus on just two uh, issues related to the batteries. The first one is the high energy chemistry. What are the materials? How do we enable that to, for the high energy? This also helps reducing the cost per kilowatt hour. And some of the new battery chemistry I want to share with the, uh, uh, the audience. Uh, that look very exciting, very promising for the grid scale, large scale energy storage. So let's look at the high energy chemistry. You know, um, the lithium ion so far, right, in, in, the, the, the Nobel Prize winning is based on this uh, intercalation chemistry. Here is a plot of a relative volume change in the vertical axis of the materials. Once lithium coming in and going out, and horizontal axis is this lithium atomic number versus the host material you are hosting the lithium coming in and out. What's that ratio? We are roughly learn how to use one to six only right here, right? This is past about 30 years now. This is what we learn how to do. But to store more energy, you need to increase the ratio of lithium in the host material going up. You know, this ratio is increased from left to right. And the relative volume change in, it will become bigger and bigger until you hit to the end, lithium metal. There's no host right there, just lithium metal plating and stripping. So the volume change in the plated state and the you know, strip state is one is a field, the other is empty. So this is relative sense is infinite. And uh, I want to present you, this is a really big challenge right there to handle these materials because the change is simply too big in the volume and the structure. Uh, this is my post, uh, my previous student now, a uh, post at MIT. I think some of you probably already know, uh, uh, and Helen, uh, and Alan uh, Hatton's group. Um, and uh, so if you compare, right, the new materials, uh, lithium ion coming in, electrons coming in, you put so many coming in, you cause chemical bomb breaking on the right. And the atoms of host materials move to very long distance, complete structure change, huge volume exp expansion. You are talking about 10 times or more compared to previous generation of uh, intercalation materials. So these are the challenges I think for the whole materials community to really come up solution. We need to come up solution to solve. We need to understand this is a new uh, regime of uh, uh, material science, electrochemistry, we need to handle. Um, so in, in the past 15 years also, so we have been dealing with, particularly on the anode side, moving from graphite to silicon, lithium metal, and going from intercalation to this alloy anode mechanism. And the positive electrode going from this intercalation to this also, I call this as a conversion, Lithium, the sulfur, right? Lithium uh, sulfur become lithium sulfide. And this all enable charge storage capacity of uh, 10 times 
uh, uh, higher compared to the uh, past materials we use or the existing material we use. Uh, and with the new materials coming in, it's possible to increase the amount of energy you store per unit weight from this graphite uh, MMC, right, lithium nickel manganese cobalt oxide system, roughly 250, you know, slightly higher right now, uh, and to silicon 400 and slightly above, metallic lithium MMC, 500 and lithium sulfur, perhaps 600 or 800 watt per kilogram possibility. And with the new materials coming in, let me start from the example of silicon. Silicon is the case, can take a lot of lithium. And the reason is silicon alloy with lithium. And uh, one silicon atom can store up to about four lithium atom. But carbon case is six carbon, this is graphite. The ratio is one lithium, six carbon. So this charge storage capacity per unit weight, uh, it's uh, about this 10 times different. Silicon is 10 times higher. By the same time, because so many lithium ions coming in, also causing four times volume expansion roughly. And this caused huge mechanical issue coming up. Uh, the strain, the stress is too big and caused the breaking of the materials. And not only that, and we know uh, the anode side and uh, it's so reactive with organic electrolyte and it will cause the self-decomposition compound formation, so-called the solid electrolyte interface, SEI. This layer needs to be stable with the volume expansion, once lithium coming in, and uh, once lithium going out, volume can shrink. This process made the interface not stable. It, they're moving all the time mechanically, dimensional-wise. Very hard to build stable solid electrolyte interface, so the battery fade very fast. Uh, back in 2008, 2008, January, we published this first paper of using silicon nanostructure in form of nanowires uh, grow from the current collector to recognize this could be the really ideal structure to maintain electrical contact between the silicon and the underlying substrate. And the dimension of these wires are small enough and they can relax the strain without breaking. And uh, this really started the effort of uh, using a uh, nanoscience approach uh, to design the materials to solve the very challenging problem and this new class of exciting material that could potentially have the breakthrough for the, for the battery field. Uh, Candice Chen was my first graduate student, now a faculty member in Arizona State and started this uh, research together with me. So let me show you <clears throat> to understand what's happening inside. We need a new tool. This change is so dramatic. Working with my colleague here, Bill Nix, a mechanical expert, and uh, my uh, previous graduate student, now a faculty a member in Georgia Tech, Matt uh, Madell, uh, we developed this tool of uh, in situ TEM. You can charge and discharge your batteries while watching it, what, how it happened and the electron microscope. This is learning from the uh, uh, pioneer work from Jenny Huang and Chongming Wang, the first science paper. Uh, and, this, and this one, this has a special holder. And this holder, right, you can mount your material onto an electrical probe and pop it into, this is a piezo electrical control, moving in and out, up and down, you know, uh, 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 and left and right to contact with uh, electrolyte. This electrolyte has low wafer pressure, so it can survive in a high TEM vacuum condition inside TEM. Then your cathode is built right there. You are applying a voltage, driving the electrons in and out. So electron goes in during charging and to charge neutralize the electron, lithium diffuse in and charge neutralize the electron and start to charge up your uh, materials. You can watch what's happening and the electron beam is looking at your solid state wires, not the ionic liquid. Ionic liquid will not be stable you know, under the E-beam. And you can put down the particles right there. You can watch the particles as well. So the first video I want to show you is the change is so dramatic. This is 200 nanometer scale bar. So roughly about 200 nanometer diameter wires right here. When you put lithium going in, you can see the volume expansion is gigantic. And this nanowire surface is coated by copper, right? 
you are using the voltage driving electrons to go in, lithium diffusion, the electrochemical reaction taking place. This volume expansion has huge thermodynamic driving force right there. And, and this expansion is so powerful, the surrounding coating is broken, the copper, the black color. However, these nanowires, they survive, they don't break. Uh, we also look at the uh, particles, different sizes, try to understand the critical breaking size. The central particles right here is 800 nanometer in diameter. You put lithium going in, the volume expansion takes place, and there's a huge stress building up. At some point, stress reach a critical point and uh, really start to tear these materials open. You see this particle is broken. Once it's broken, and you lose electrical contact between the materials, you increase the surface area that have a more chemical reaction. So uh, this battery fades very fast. Using an C2 TEM like this, we can identify what's the critical breaking size. It's about 150 nanometer or so. This turned out to be uh, important to provide to the whole community, to the industry, the guideline, what are the particle size you cho choose to avoid the breaking. These uh, turn out to be important right now around the world. Uh, many batteries uh, companies use this uh, as the guideline to choose their particles. So I also want to show, share with you the rich phenomenon of uh, end materials level. Well, if you use a more for silicon particles to start with, the behavior is completely different. This is a nanowire in the middle. These particles are the morphous, and you put lithium in. Their phase behavior is very different right there because the morphous is silicon. There's many dangling bonds inside, and uh, uh, its uh, uh, density is uh, lower. There's actually poor pond defect vacancies, a lot of vacancies sites right there. Then you put lithium going in they are more tolerant of this volume expansion cause the mechanical failure. And their stress level building up is not as big. And the big particles, you know, up to a micron in size even can survive with this volume expansion. So with all this understanding over the years, we have been designing materials from the nanowires to core shell wires to hollow structure that can relax, relax the strain better and to a uh, double wall hollow structure, try to maintain, build up, try to build a stable interface because this double wall hollow structure, we can force silicon volume expansion towards inside and the outer surface is stable uh, without changing uh, or, or minimize the changes that can build stable solid electron interface. So I won't bother you with all these uh, generation, 12 generation of design, and each generation we try to solve uh, uh, one big problem right there. So at this moment, the industry is, is pushing hard, uh, try to use, utilize silicon to build up the high energy density batteries. Uh, you have seen in the news, including company like Tesla is uh, trying to utilize sil silicon. Uh, 2008, I found the Empress and uh, to, uh, 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 really commercialize the silicon nanostructure inner for my lab. Empress has been having really high energy density battery right now, 430 watt per kilogram type of range using uh, nearly just pure silicon right there, you know, 1200, 1300 watt per liter. Empress is providing battery to Airbus Cyphers S. Uh, this has break the world record in the flight time, right, 25 days continuously. During the day, you know, charge the so thin film solar cell right there, charge up the batteries with solar cells and uh, during the night, so it rely on the batteries to, to fly. This requires very high energy density. We also have a, a manufacturing uh, a facility in Uxi City in China. Uh, that's not for the nanowire case, this is more for the uh, you know, silicon and graphite uh, or mixture. So things are moving. Uh, silicon is still challenging for industry to adopt because there's so many problems industry need to learn how, how to deal with. Empress uh, uh, is making great progress on that and uh, I look forward to seeing more uh, you know, silicon based batteries coming out to the market. Um, then the holy grail of the uh, lithium based system is actually metallic lithium, and no. 
Uh, you can use lithium metal to make to do to do anode to make the batteries that can offer potential very high energy density, go up to 500 watt per kilo. So uh, roughly about close to four years ago, um, the uh, battery 500 consortium was announced. Uh, uh, the whole consortium is making great progress, uh, led by PNNL National Lab and uh, SLAC Stanford and other institution also participate. Uh, I serve as a co-director. Uh, director is uh, Dr. Jun Lu and PNNL uh, to really trying to you know, come up with a solution for the 500 watt per kilogram of the batteries. Then we need to consider metallic lithium. Now there's a whole wide world of rays and, and try to develop lithium metal anode into reality. So lithium metal anode has no host anymore. Uh, and uh, back in 2017, we published this review paper recognizing all this problem. Uh, lithium metal is based on the plating and stripping mechanism uh, during uh, charging and discharging. And during this process, dimension change is very big. You're doing plating, there's no guarantee you can do really flat layer by layer plating. And then you cause the surface uh, morphology change. And this will tear open, will break this solid electrolyte interface because the lithium metal is so reactive, it's going to form an SEI layer. And once this is broken, this hot spot to grow out this dendritic structure. Once you do lithium stripping, and you don't know where it's going to strip. It can strip from the bottom. Then once you strip from the bottom, this filamental structure, they disconnect from the underlying lithium foil. You cause a lot of so-called dead lithium formation. They are not connected with the underlying substrate anymore. Uh, we use the term dead lithium means, you know, you cannot recover that capacity. And over cycles, these will, you know, before long, these all decay. Um, so this change is dramatic. Each of this layer of plating of lithium three million hour per centimeter square, that's the typical area capacity you need. And during this plating process, you have 15 micron of lithium building up. It's a lot of dimension change. When you use that, you discharge it, this 15 micron coming down, that's gone. And this is really building instability in your battery cell. And uh, to recognize what are the root causes, number one is, is high chemical reactivity of lithium. That's really challenging. It reacts with electrolyte. We have not been able to find any electrolyte yet, you know, really stable, liquid electrolyte, right? Stable against lithium, even for solid electrolyte, uh, nearly none, maybe there's only a few that can be uh, 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 stable to some degree uh, to the uh, lithium metal. And also this volume change is too big. Surrounding has a lot of problems, dendrite formation, cause battery shorting, catching fire, you know, battery fading. So to solve the root causes, we need to come up with a material strategy that can really address the problem directly. So uh, working with uh, Professor Steve Chu and Jenan Bao here at Stanford, um, particularly with Steve in 2016, I consider is a really breakthrough year for, for, for us is we propose the stable host concept. We need to learn from graphite, right, hosting lithium, silicon hosting lithium. We also need to construct a framework, allow lithium to deposit going inside. So you maintain the dimension stability first without continuous volume fluctuation. Then you have a hope to build stable interface. Certainly for the interface, it needs to be chemically stable, mechanically resilient, and how do you do that, right? And these are the criteria we point out in 2014. It needs to be chemically stable, not reacting anymore. Mechanic, mechanically resilient means stable. Doesn't mean, does not necessarily mean it needs to be mechanically harder, stronger, right? It can be, it can be soft, but it needs to be resilient. So using uh, uh, many examples, we uh, demonstrate uh, uh, these new ideas can come in and improve a lot. So for the host concept design, for let me share with you, there are two breakthroughs right there. We uh, illustrate in, back in 2016. One is on the left-hand side, we see lithium metal deposition on copper has a nucleation barrier from the voltage curve. You see a voltage deep and overshoot, right? And then come back. 
is a 40 milliwatt of uh, nucleation over potential. You know, lithium nuclear on copper, they, they are not the same material. They don't really like each other that much. This heterogeneous nucleation, there is a nucleation over potential right there. But on gold surface, you know, you see the lithium plating right here highlighted. There's no voltage deep. There's no nucleation uh, potential. Actually, there's a deep material science reason behind that. You look at the phase diagram, copper and lithium on the top, gold and lithium at the bottom, close to the right-hand side. Let me uh, bring your attention to gold right here. There's a, a tiny zone in the phase diagram right there at room temperature. Gold has solubility in lithium. So what it means, once lithium coming in, it dissolves gold away, make gold more and more look like lithium before the lithium deposition happening. This gradual change, there's no nucleation barrier right there. But copper and lithium, they are different crystal structure. Copper is FCC, lithium is BCC. They have different atomic distance. All of this adding together, you know, uh, the nucleation on copper is not favor. You need to put more energy going in to cause lithium nucleation taking place. So based on this uh, materials uh, principle, we actually screen a bunch of metal right there. Uh, gold, silver, zinc, magnesium, these are the voltage curve. You don't see that voltage deep. They're really good as a metal to help lithium plating without nucleation barrier right there. But these common materials as copper, carbon, nickel all have some nucleation barriers so we need to pay attention to. So this differentiation between different materials and promote lithium plating allow us to now for the first time to spatially control where lithium would go during electrochemical deposition. Here is the uh, uh, demonstration we show is a gold line pattern onto copper substrate. When you deposit lithium, you see lithium metal go onto where the gold is. They don't want to go to the copper, right? This is within reasonable current density. Uh, if you go to too high current density, of course you're driving this too crazy. And then the differentiation becomes small between gold and copper. You might deposit everywhere if you go to very high current. So this now allow us to design for the first time of a host for lithium metal. This is hollow carbon sphere, about a micron in diameter. And with the particles uh, as a nucleation seed in there, this is gold nanoparticles. We know gold is too expensive. Eventually we cannot use gold, but this is for concept demonstration. In the future, we could use things like magnesium, uh, zinc, things like that. So we made this structure. And these are the hollow carbon sphere with this black dot in there, they're gold, uh, nanoparticle. You can control the number, control the nucleation seed, you know, how, man, how many do you have in there? So I want to show you in situ TEM, how we play lithium, deposit lithium into this hollow carbon with the gold seed to show you uh, we have this lithium coming in, this, gold, this is black dot, it's gold nanoparticle. Now lithium dissolve gold away. And now lithium is going to this hollow carbon sphere. And the important phenomenon I want to show you is the, the, the mechanism. Lithium can dissolve gold away. This function as the nucleation seed. If you strip lithium away, the gold nanoparticles come back. They are in different location right now. Now you plate it again, and it can dissolve uh, the gold away again. Uh, with this, we construct a battery electrode using hollow carbon uh, particle at the bottom. You, you see right here, right? This is with the gold seed uh, in there. And uh, you play lithium. You look at the morphology under scanning electron microscopy. You don't see lithium nucleation in growing outside. They're all going into this hollow carbon. But the top case is hollow carbon without gold seed. And they will plate it inside. Uh, so they will plate it outside forming this filament. And you can see the nucleation power of this gold seeds in this hollow carbon. Now promote lithium metal inside this hollow carbon and this interfacial layer is forming by the hollow carbon. Make this uh, lithium metal more stable. This hollow carbon will isolate lithium metal from the organic liquid electrolyte and build st a stable solid electrolyte interface. So with this in mind, we say, well, how do we construct a lithium metal host? Uh, not by electrochemical reaction. Electrochemistry is good to demonstrate the concept, but we really want a lithium metal foil. Lithium metal is already embedded into the host materials. 
So my student in Chang now a postdoc at Harvard, Ya Yuan again, a postdoc at MIT, uh, uh, team up to, to work on this problem. We indeed develop a modern, a new method is called modern infusion of lithium metal into the host materials. So we started to screen early days back in about 2015, uh, you know, all type of carbon materials. And then what you see right here is this lithium. You heat it up, you melt it. Lithium's melting point is 180 degrees Celsius also. And it boils up. It doesn't like to wet the carbon underneath. So this wetting problem right there, we cannot you know, infuse this lithium going into these host materials. And then when we try graphene oxide, it melts, it goes in. You can see the morphology is very different. So apparently this is a phenomenon very similar to water hydrophobic and hydrophilic. So we call the new term lithophilic for the wetting of lithium, lithophobic for the uh, uh, non-wetting phenomenon of the uh, molten lithium. So it's not really widely used in the whole research field. Uh, let me show you what's the reason behind that. The graphene oxide has a lot, a lot of oxygen functional group, right? You put this graphene oxide stack made by filtration uh, from solution. You notice there's a spark right there. This is spark reaction once it touches the molten lithium. This reaction create a gas species. You know, open up the gap between graphene oxide and a nanometer to 100 nanometer region. And then after the spark reaction, um, you let's look at the bottom one. Uh, there's a nanoscale gap in there, right? Now you put this in, into molten lithium, you see this bright spot, golden color. This is molten lithium start to wet and really going into the graphene oxide. This is through the wetting phenomenon, the uh, capillary force pulling this uh, molten liquid, going into this graphene oxide uh, very quickly. Uh, forming this golden color of lithium metal sandwich between graphene oxide. So if you look at uh, what's really right there, we start from GO, that's graphene oxide film, spark reaction, open, uh, opening up a gap, and then lithium metal, the molten one, you know, really going in. Now you have a host of the graphene oxide. Let me remind you this graphene oxide, you don't put in that much of the dead weight, it's only 8%. So your lithium metal, milliamp hour per gram of capacity per unit weight is still maintained. Milliamp hour per volume per, you know, per liter is still very, very high. Uh, now you look at this, this a cross section, and it, and it really provides a stable house. You put lithium in, you take lithium out, they don't uh, create this large volume fluctuation anymore. You can even virtually can go down to you know the volume fluctuation becomes zero and then you can build stable solid electron interface uh, we see there's a uh, really a lot of stability gain uh, we have through this uh, material system so over the years we develop a, a large number of hosts in this uh, polymer nanofiber host uh, porous metal foam host and we can take silicon monoxide over reactive with lithium put in more lithium in the molten phase and then it's stored in this uh, silicon monoxide host. Silicon monoxide will change, become lithium silicon plus lithium oxide. And aluminum fluoride is another example. Uh, react with uh, a molten lithium, generate you know, this lithium metal domain embedded inside of lithium fluoride and uh, lithium aluminum alloy, forming this uh, very stable host. I'm also glad to see in the whole research field uh, there are many groups around the world uh, now working on the host materials, hosting lithium, and uh, to make lithium uh, more stable. Uh, I uh, really appreciate the progress in the whole field. Um, and, and then with this uh, stable host right there, we need to have stable interface as well. Over the years, my group looked into different materials coating uh, to build a stable uh, solid electro interface. And we know lithium metal is very reactive. Um, and uh, we do need to have a very robust interface right there. Uh, I want to show you one example of the stable interface forming through our new electrolyte design. And uh, about a month ago, 
we published this paper in Nature Energy, and, and this is uh, in collaboration with uh, uh, Zhenan Bao's lab, uh, two graduate students, Zhao and Han Sun, they're they are leading the project. Let me show you what's exciting about this. You know, this all type of electrolyte people are exploring uh, uh, right now, uh, including uh, I think uh, our uh, host right here, right, our chair conference chair Ju and, and others are uh, looking into this issue. And this is dimethyl ether right there. This is the one we know uh, compared to the carbonate electrolyte. This uh, is more stable on the lithium metal side. Uh, but still not stable enough. And it's not stable against high voltage castle, it will get oxidized. If you extend this uh, hydrocarbon chain, right? Now, instead of having two carbon here, you have four carbon. Now this is called DMB. Uh, it's uh, still only partially stable versus metallic lithium, but its stability on the high voltage side is improved, but still not sufficient, still not sufficient. What well, turned out to be in this hydrocarbon chain in the middle, right there, this central carbon, we put in two chlorine on each carbon, uh, sorry, fluorine on each two carbon, right? So we have four fluorine right here. Now this is fluorinated DMB. So this is FDMB. What we start to, you know, once you put fluorine right, it increased is a, a chemical, electrochemical stability. Uh, this uh, fluorine start to pull electrons uh, slightly away from the oxygen, right? Because fluorine is going to pull on this carbon, pull electrons slightly away from this oxygen. And then make this uh, solvation power with lithium weaker. You, re is, you are weakening that. But with fluorine right there, you enhance the chemical stability tremendously. It's a stable, much more stable on, versus lithium on the lithium side. And it's also much more stable, allow you to go to the higher voltage. So this is a voltage scan on the high voltage side. You see which FDMB right there. Go up to quite high voltage is still stable. If you have DME only, the either one, you see, you see 3.9 volt, it starts to decompose, right? And this a DMB, longer hydrocarbon one, is better, but FDMB fluorinate is so much better. And then once we deposit lithium, and with the plating and stripping, we look at the chlorine efficiency, it go up to 99.5%, uh, roughly close to, to that range fast. And it's a method to evaluate that uh, of uh, ABA method. So it becomes, uh, I think, probably the best uh, electrolyte. A, this a single solvent, you know, we dissolve uh, lithium uh, FSI in there. This so far give the best chromatic efficiency among the uh, all electrolyte system. There, there are a few others electrolyte. Uh, uh, I think uh, uh, certainly very exciting one is a high concentration one. I think Ju is very familiar with. Uh, uh, and uh, there's also uh, uh, other you know electrolyte mixture additive, and, and people obtain uh, close close to this uh, uh, chromatic efficiency number. Then we found the reason is. Uh, this deposition change morphology with FDMB become this a larger grain uh, of the lithium deposition versus DME. You know, this is very more silicium, you know, uh, you, you, and uh, if carbon electrolyte, you see the dendrite formation. So this a big grain reduce the surface area a lot. Not only that, and once we use a cryogenic electron microscopy, uh, uh, my group developed uh, several years ago, that can stabilize. Uh, these uh, solid electron interface, we can study FDMB one has this really thin six nanometer instead of 20 nanometer usually in the carbonate electrolyte system. It's much thinner SCI interface layer. It's amorphous, it's more uniform. And also down the road, we were going to report more why this electrolyte system using FDMB is working so well. To understand the solvation, we work with uh, Professor Jian Chen, you know, uh, doing simulation uh, and his postdoc, Shen Kong. Uh, and you know, usually this electrolyte, they don't have color, but FDMB, you know, it's very different. It's actually have this color, right? This uh, a brownish color right, right there. I mean, that's really strange. Uh, uh, it turned out to be this coordination of FDMB, this oxygen right here in the fluorine. You know, fluorine is not uh, bonded to this carbon, but it's the second carbon here. This provide a coordination, both lithium and fluorine coming in. 
not only that this coordination actually is not that strong, solvation power is not that strong. These are uh, indeed during this uh, coordination process, the anion from the salt, it also participates, participates significantly in the solvation shell. So when we have the SCI formation decomposition of, of lithium metal with an electrolyte, right? There's a lot of anion, the salt anion right there in this SCI layer. Instead of solvent decomposition dominating becomes the anion going to the SCI, forming uniform SCI layer. Uh, uh, through our uh, chemical analysis of the interfacial layer, we also saw that. Uh, it, it, it's really, I think, uh, uh, the new type of electrolyte design becomes uh, very, very important. Uh, we, we now, based on this initial work, discover you know, several more really exciting new molecules uh, to, to be used. Uh, when I say new, this one is actually really new. You know, this molecule does not exist before. So this was the first time we made, made, made this molecule, FDMB. So with the remaining maybe few minutes, let me mention that when the new batteries chemistry and the electro, new redox chemistry continue to be exciting. Uh, and uh, you know, our co-chair, conference co-chair Mike Aziz right here working on the redox flow, uh, a very exciting uh, chemistry exploring uh, for the grid scale storage. Over the years, my group also looked into the new chemistry uh, this is a decade ago, so the pressure blue like materials and, and uh, very fast uh, chemistry right there. However, energy density is low. We try to target for the grid scale storage. Uh, uh, this, uh, uh, the cost of this might not be low enough. So we also explore, you know, the uh, polysulfide semi-flow batteries, you know, uh, also pretty, pretty exciting, but very challenging. Most recently, let me highlight, we developed a new chemistry called metal hydrogen gas. I'm going to say a few more words about that. And also the molten lithium chemistry with solid electrolyte in the middle. The anode is uh, molten lithium, the cathode is also molten. Oh, it turned out to be this awful uh, uh, new uh, thinking uh, right there. If you're looking at Professor Saddleway at MIT, right, developing all molten batteries in this case, uh, uh, our middle layer electrolyte is not molten. It's a solid state. This is a, 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 an analogy to the molten sodium battery using a beta aluminum in the middle. However, because the lithium melting point uh, is 180, and also the uh, lithium ion, a solid ion conductor is a lot more conducting than the sodium one so far. And this allows to go down to the temperature really low, only a slightly above 200 degrees C, about 240, 250 also. So the lower the temperature, uh, this allow you in the engineering design becomes much more convenient. Uh, uh, I think this is a new areas to explore, but let me mention a, a few words about metal hydrogen gas batteries right there. And in the past few years, my lab demonstrate this chemistry. If you look at what's the longest lifetime of cathode anode, cathode is nickel hydroxide, nickel, nickel oxyhydroxide. Really, it's rare to find another cathode chemistry that can beat this one. This one can go up to 100,000 cycles. What's the best long lifetime anode? That's hydrogen become water back and forth. That's the half of the fuel cell. We indeed combine these two together to build a battery called nickel hydrogen gas batteries. The, the performance, we are really get blown away by the performance right there, right? We build this battery cell, it's running 10,000 cycle, 95% capacity retention, and this can go to very fast charging within five minutes, charging is possible, a equal solution, potassium hydroxide solution right there. And we also invented a completely new chemistry for the first time, it's the manganese combination. Manganese uh, dissolved state become the solid state, you know, dissolution and stripping for the cathode. And then using hydrogen as the anode, manganese is very low cost. We generally, you know, propose and demonstrate for the first time manganese hydrogen gas batteries also run for very long cycle life, 10,000 cycles right there, right? This is aqueous system. Uh, I, I was very uh, excited by this new chemistry uh, uh, and, and see the great potential of that for the grid scale storage. This type of system allow you to go to about 70 to 100 watt per kilogram. It's not very high, you know, lithium is 250 or higher, but this is about a, a half or a one third of lithium. However, this is for stationary storage. It has the benefit of very long cycle life, low cost, 
great safety. So past two years, I was incubating this technology now, making into this a uh, really big vessel. You see this big vessel of the cell. Uh, and a few months ago, I just found now a, a new company called Anna and to develop this breakthrough metal hydrogen battery into the you know a commercial, this is a prototype or product, and it's highly durable, very safe, maintenance free, flexible, it's uh, affordable, very low cost. We are really trying to targeting into eventually we can get to per kilowatt hour storage. It's about a penny of a storage. And uh, uh, this is a proven technology with a long 30 years lifetime, uh, extremely long cycle life or 30,000 cycles or longer. And uh, we will be announced soon, but I can already announce right here, we just closed uh, the, uh, 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 the first round of financing of uh, a pretty sizable amount to now already having a battery pack. Uh, we are going to uh, develop into uh, you know megawatt hour of a storage system. Uh, I, I hope you can see uh, you know, the impact of this technology down the road to the grid scale. So let me conclude my talks. So I, I, I was showing you uh, two uh, example area, one on the high energy density battery, the chemistry, and the other one is this a new chemistry for the grid scale. Uh, without uh, further ado, just by saying, you know, batteries is absolutely a great solution for the mobile application. And uh, in my, uh, based on my observation of the community and my own, my own work, it has a great potential to also impact the grid scale. And for the next decade or two decades to come, I hope we have the joint force right here to help uh, uh, mitigate the climate change problem, the CO2 problem. Let me end my talk by thanking the whole research group and the funding support, particularly from the D from DOE uh, funding agencies. And thank you very much, G and uh, Michael, uh, for organizing this. Uh, I'd like to thank MIT to, to host this conf conference. I would be happy to take any questions you have. Thank you so much, E, for this uh, wonderful talk. Uh, I actually have uh, many questions. And maybe I'll start by asking, uh, in these uh, very exciting high energy anode work, uh, you've shown that uh, developing uh, fluorinated uh, liquid electrolyte is generally helpful because it improves uh, safety, improves uh, cycle life. Uh, I have a question on uh, how scalable is the fluorine chemistry? And then uh, if one really scales this up, what about environmental impact? Uh, uh, is there a way to recycle uh, these uh, uh, fluorinated uh, uh, electrolytes? Yeah, Ju, this is a great question. So certainly fluorine chemistry is already used in the color lithium ion batteries, right? The lithium PF6 salt is a fluorine chemistry. Many additives like fluorinated ethylene carbonate is already used as additive. Uh, these FDMB molecules, in terms of synthesis, large quantity is actually very simple. The, the synthesis is very straightforward. This one is, uh, I think the scaling, the cost will not be an issue. Is this one step synthesis we, we, we have. Uh, then we still need to be careful about the fluorine chemistry. Uh, we all know fluorinated uh, carbon, of course, is, uh, can have environmental impact right there. That's why I think the whole battery recycling, uh, reuse recycling, uh, now I encourage everybody to think about that in academia. Uh, we don't have the uh, most economic way to, to do a good job yet. We're still far away from there. I'm glad the OE in, uh, started the center in Argonne National Lab to do recycling, but that's mostly for uh, you know, highly valuable cobalt, nickel, maybe lithium right there. And, and with the fluorine right there, uh, we need to come our way to recover that we don't want to improve, uh, pollute the uh, uh, environment with the uh, fluorinated chemistry. I, I don't know, burning it can be uh, one way to do it, but we need to be careful to recover the fluorine containing compound not released to the environment. Or need to convert that into something is a fluorine compound, maybe more in, in an inorganic compound that, that can be stable, easily can recover back. Great. Uh, there is a question. Uh, do you see the inner venue venture producing batteries for long duration storage or for daily cycling? How scalable is this? Uh, well, you've actually already mentioned gigawatt hours, so it should be pretty scalable. So yeah, um, the uh, 
I think the uh, and the value uh, so far, I think it's this makes more sense from the characteristic, uh, very fast charging possible, a long cycle life, you, you want to use more cycle, it makes a more economic sense. It's probably within three days, I think uh, type of storage, right, there are 72 hours. If you look for a hundred hours, right, about a week, let's see, and then every year you only use about 50 cycles then, uh, and they change the whole cost. Uh, uh, profile a, a lot. So our system level cost analysis, we know how low we can get down to. For the long duration storage, you're looking for system level, you know, 50, $30 per kilowatt hour or less. Uh, then we, we need to work more towards that. We are, we are not at this moment for the long duration yet. We are more for the kind of within three days, yeah. Uh, so there's a related question. I think you kind of address that of hydrogen storage. So uh, generally hydrogen leaks out of valves and, and containers. So uh, I guess there is a, there is a, a, a use time. Uh, so you can, uh, you know, uh, supply the electricity for let's say three days, but then there is also a hold time. Like you can store this electricity, let's say for, for certain duration. So uh, do you think uh, how long is the hold time? Um, yeah, so hydrogen and material science has this famous problem, hydrogen embrittlement, <laughs> uh, and also uh, that will later uh, leak, leak out, right? Well, it turned out to be uh, this chemistry, th this metal hydrogen gas, uh, the nic nickel case, has been used in aerospace for the past 40 years. The Hubble telescope, uh, now 30 years, is using this chemistry. It it's completely amazing. So uh, uh, indeed, this has been figured out. It's a sealed vessel welding together, maintenance free. And uh, if you pick the right materials, uh, uh, it's actually not high cost material vessel either. And uh, this hydrogen embrittlement uh, uh, could be solved. Yeah, it could be solved. It, it's it's already you. proven to be solved. Thank you. Um, there is uh, another question of, you've shown uh, most of the lithium chemistries, but we know uh, that uh, at some point there might be a, a run on lithium. So uh, what about sodium and other alkali metals? Of course, sodium metal have, a, I think, even bigger explosion risk uh, compared to lithium. So yeah. uh, have you thought about uh, other alkali metal based uh, batteries and chemistries? Yeah, there are a lot of research on sodium and even potassium system, right? And, uh, um, so uh, a lot of exciting research right there. I think highly valuable. Uh, sodium is a lot more, uh, it's cheaper abundant. So sodium, sodium metal anode is a lot more reactive than lithium for sure. So I, I, I see this, uh, uh, the availability issue right there, lithium, uh, we are still having, we still have a lot of lithium lasting for quite a long time. We need to recycle that also. And also remember there's a lot of uh, low, relative, it's a lower concentration of lithium. Uh, and particularly in the ocean, very low, right? 178 ppb, but a lot of uh, a lot of lithium right there. We need to do quite a bit of research. How do we extract lithium out of the non-traditional source? I think that's first number one we need to do because lithium system is already working so well. And with that saying, I think the whole society still need to have uh, uh, sodium and other air climate metal to. Iron, we, we need to have technology backup. And also summer system, sodium makes a lot of sense for the, particularly in the grid scale storage system, yeah. Great, uh, I think uh, with that, uh, uh, thank you uh, Yi uh, for this wonderful uh, presentation. And I think uh, Professor Mike Aziz uh, will take over. Yes, we can clap <laughs> virtually also. And we actually have a, a coffee break. Uh, of course, it's a virtual break. Uh, people feel free to check uh, your emails, but come back at uh, 1025. And also I think uh, in this duration, the mic is open so we can have all the panelists. Uh, there is like uh, 15 panelists, feel free to discuss and, and, and chat. And uh, we'll come back uh, uh, at 10, uh, 1025. And uh...